So we went to Las Vegas last week to meet and interview the president of the USC, UFC, Dana White, and we're not exactly sure what to expect. We were highly impressed. It turns out that his experiences of the past several years are very similar to the experiences of millions of business owners in this country. The difference is he found a way to keep going. He told us that during the COVID lockdowns, the government tried to shut him down completely. And of course, the media were intent on helping the government do that. CBS, for example, reported that, quote, Dana White is an epidemic on his hands. The Washington Post reported that, quote, epidemiologist blasts UFC President Dana White. Of course, there was never any evidence that Dana White had in any way contributed to the pandemic. It was all a lie. So the point of the story, however, is that Dana White kept UFC alive during the lockdowns. He did not bow to pressure. He persisted, didn't lay off a single person. It's an inspiring story. Here's part of it. Dana White, thank you for having us. Thanks for having I've me. never done an interview with human blood on the floor, <laughs> and I like it. So the first thing I noticed, having watched a lot of UFC, is how small this is, the octagon right. in real life. There is no place to run. Yeah, it's, it, so this is a smaller version of it that we use here at the Apex, but when we go into arenas, we use a bigger one. This would look like a, like a matchbox in some of the arenas that we go to. The, the, the one that they fight in uh, on pay-per-view in, in arenas is much bigger. What do the fighters think of being <laughs> locked in a space this small? With it's funny because we used to talk about, you know, fights are probably more exciting and more, there's more engagement in a smaller octagon, but it's not true. We actually did studies on it. And uh, there are just as many finishes in the big one as there are in the small one. Interesting. So this is your arena where a lot of your fights take place in your building in a world you completely control. 100%. So this, ironically, was built, we were literally putting the last nails and screws in this place right when COVID hit. So it couldn't have been more perfect if we were actually allowed to use the arena because they shut Nevada down and, uh, you know, we, we couldn't even do it in our own facility that we controlled and that we could have created a bubble here, but they, you know, the government wouldn't let, wouldn't let us. So you're in the sports business and I should say, you're really the only figure left in American sports who controls the sport. I mean, you're in charge of the sport. Right. So that's not a model that exists anywhere else. But you're responsible for the sport, and now you can't have in-person events. What, you know, where does that leave you at the beginning of COVID? Yeah, it, it, it was tough. Uh, you know, I say it all the time. COVID is, is the, uh, was the toughest thing I've ever had to navigate in the history of this company. And if you look at where we came from, that's actually saying something. But... My, my attitude and my thought process was, uh, this is America, we, we don't quit, we don't give up, and we definitely don't run and hide in our houses. So I figured there had to be a way. So COVID happens, companies start laying off big percentages of the workforce. They don't know how long the quarantines are gonna remain in effect, they're indefinite, and they've got these payrolls they have to meet. You did not lay people off. No, my people, a lot of my people around here have been with me for a long time. 10 to 20 years. And, you know, we do events every weekend. These people work hard. They've been dedicated to this company, to me. And, the, you know, if you look at COVID, it's probably the scariest thing to ever happen in the history of my life. And to all of a sudden just dump my employees uh, the minute something bad happens, it's just not the way that I'm built. It wasn't gonna happen, no matter what. I'd have rather have seen the whole company burn and go down in flames before I would hurt my employees. So you paid everybody? Paid everybody. So that introduces a math problem though into your life because you got a lot of money going out and no money coming in. Right. So what do you do? You figure out how to put on events. You figure out how to, how to keep the show alive and keep it going. At the time, you know, I'm, I'm close to the royal family in, in Abu Dhabi and they were doing testing over there. Well, if they were doing testing, we could do testing here. It was just a matter of figuring out how to do it and figuring out a place where we could go, where we could build a true bubble and make sure that people were safe and, and, and put on events. So you went to Abu Dhabi? Yeah, so originally we were looking for an island. <laughs> Islands made sense. Mike Tyson called me and had some guys, I don't remember what island it was, that said, you can come to our island and, 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 and do the fights. <laughs> there was literally no- Like a private island? There was no infrastructure there. No, nothing. So that was out. And then we ended up talking to Abu Dhabi and they suggested Yaz Island in Abu Dhabi. And, and it was really the only true bubble that existed in sports because 
They brought people in, there were workers, the workers in the hotel, the workers in the restaurant, all the people that were at Yaz, Yaz Island were tested before they went there and they were there for weeks being tested regularly before we even got there. Then the people that we were bringing over, we tested, flew over on our own private plane that only we were on, got to the island, we were tested again and tested multiple times up until the event happened and then everybody would go home. So it was the only true bubble that really existed. So that allowed you to keep your sport on the air when everything else was shut down. Right. Why didn't everyone else do that? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. It, it, you know what? I took a lot of heat, took a lot of bullets, took a lot of- uh, On what cr grounds? Criticism. Well, you, that's what the media does. Media does nothing. They, 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 they never built anything. Uh, nobody depends on them for a paycheck, but all they do is sit back and criticize. I'm going to kill people. I care more about money than I do human life. I, I heard it all, and, and, and the New York Times, as you can imagine, was, was blasting me daily. Because you were trying to keep your employees paid and fed and keep your business going. Right, because you're, you're, you're trying to figure out solutions to problems. You're trying to, you know, everybody felt like it was this narrative during COVID that if you didn't run and hide, you were reckless, you were a monster. You didn't care about other people. Uh, and the list goes on and on. So how did you take yeah, that they criticism? Were working. Yeah, they, they, they were working. They were working. Good fuck. They were writing they stories every day. Yeah, these, these guys had nothing to worry about. They were writing horror stories every day, and they were all working. But how did you keep that out of your head? I mean, it's easy to say I don't care about criticism, but when you are criticized like that in the New York Times, the biggest newspaper in the world, it's hard to keep it out of nah, your head. It really wasn't. You know, I, I live in like my own little world over here in our own little bubble. And I knew that if I went and I figured out a way to do it, that my team would go with me. And I knew that the fighters would fight. So as long as we were all aligned and everybody felt the same way, and, and, and you know, we weren't 100% aligned. There were some fighters that were scared and a little nervous and they didn't have to fight if they didn't want to. Nobody was being forced to fight. If you wanted to fight, you could, because that's how these guys feed their families too. And how, yeah. you know, so, yeah, I kept everybody working. Was there any COVID death around you? I mean, was, the New York no, Times said you were killing people, did you? There was no COVID death. You know, there were people who caught COVID. And I was sending out weekly videos to my employees. Listen, enjoy this time that you have with your families. Relax. If you get COVID or anybody you care about gets COVID, make me your first call and we'll, we'll get you taken care of. We'll get you looked at. If you need toilet paper, toilet paper was a big deal at that time. We'll get you toilet paper. If you need food and you can't get groceries or you need anything, call us and we'll take care of you. Through COVID, me and my team became stronger than we've ever been. And then once we, it was time to get back to work, I mean, there's still companies today that people aren't back to work yet. My whole team has been back to work like maybe like three, four weeks into the beginning of the pandemic. Did and you we've lose been working anyone? straight through this whole time. Did you lose anyone? We didn't lose anyone. No, we didn't lose anyone. So you were loyal to your employees and you never had staff problems? 100%. I was loyal to my employees. My employees were loyal to me yeah. for the last 20 years. Then when the, when the shit hit the fan, I was very loyal to my people and they were loyal back. And, and, and we've gotten through this thing. We threw one hell of a Christmas party last year and we had a blast and we partied and had fun. And uh, we brought Kid Rock in. Kid Rock came and played no for way. everybody. Yeah. Kid Rock came and played for everybody. And uh, it, it's almost like it never even happened here. So you're basically showing the rest of the country how to stare down adversity and achieve and thrive despite it. It was a pretty impressive story. Did any politicians call you to say, I'm, I'm really impressed by what you're doing? Um, you know, the president at the time did, you know, obviously yep. he, he was very into it. Um, you know, um, Florida was, was massive for us. You know, Florida, I would, I would equate Florida to Abu Dhabi during these times. So what did Florida do? You know, the, the governor, Governor DeSantis, and the mayor of Jacksonville, Florida, told us, come on in, we'll host you here. You can do your events here. I have fighters from all over the world. So the fighters that were from other countries, we all brought into Abu Dhabi. All the Americans, we fought down in Jacksonville, Florida. So we were still able to run our business 
like nothing was even going on other than we didn't have fans. We didn't have a live gate because of them. Then Tillman Fertitta down in uh, Houston was saying, I need you here in my arena in Houston. How, how quick can you get here? So it'll be there as soon as your, your mayor lets me, you know? So we figured out a date and then it, then it became Houston, Texas, Jacksonville, Florida, and Abu Dhabi. Subscribe to the Fox News YouTube channel to catch our nightly opens, stories that are changing the world and changing your life. From Tucker Carlson tonight.